Okay, welcome everyone to the Research Toolkit, a guide to counting what matters. This uh, webinar is from Canadian School Libraries and BC Teacher Librarian Association. Um, and we're going to talk about what the Research Toolkit is, uh, how it can be used uh, to help inform your own practice, and also hopefully get you inspired to do some research ahead of Treasure Mountain Canada number seven. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. So, let's, uh, let's see. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, doing a land acknowledgement. Um, before I do my own land acknowledgement, I want you to take a moment. Uh, you're gonna put both feet onto the ground really just try and feel the ground beneath you depends where you are you're probably in shoes of some kind but just really feel your connection to where you are and the ground around you really think about who you are on the space that you're in the territory that you belong on and are either a part of or visiting and how you connect to it how you honor those who've gone before you and how you uh, honor those who are on that territory uh, today as well. So, and then once you're done, take a nice deep breath, center yourself, and return. Clearly, today, hobe keo watsal delti. Nasalia hobe yon so warte. Suetsen inkez su ono welye. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral lands of the Klaitli Tene, on whose land we live, work, and play. I am coming to you from Prince George, British Columbia, um, the home and KO of the uh, Klaitli Tene. In uh, Daketh, uh, the local language, Akeo is the land that we walk and have um, a responsibility to. And uh, I am on the Clayton Akeo. So it's part of this. Just think for a moment again on what Akeo you are on, wherever it is that you call home, and wherever it is that you are responsible for that land. So why are we here? Well, we're here to discuss the CSL Research Toolkit. The CSL Research Toolkit supports school library practitioners as they explore their own practice through research. And we're gonna be delving into what that means and why it is important as we go through this. But really, as we begin going through this, I really want you to think about your own practice and how you can use everything that uh, you're, we're going to talk about today to help you in your practice and using your practice to help inform others. So why, why research? Well, research has a lot of facets to it. And often we feel as practitioners, we don't belong in research. Research is that thing done in universities and by focus groups from big companies and stuff like that and science and all of that kind of thing. But it's really not. Research is about finding the answer to a question. And so what we're going to be looking at is why you might want to do that. And here are some really good re reasons. This gives you evidence on your own practice. It allows you to examine what you're doing and know whether or not it actually works. We all assume what we're doing is the right way, but is it? How do we know? Is there ways that we can find out if we are on the right track? We have a huge need for library research in Canada. Um, there are not a lot of professors of uh, li school library research in Canada. Um, and so it really comes down to us, the practitioners, to build up that repository of knowledge and to help us understand what it is that we are doing and how we're going to do it. Um, 
It's about assessing some of our most deeply held assumptions about our own practice and what they might do and how they relate. Um, it's about informing the future of both our practice and that of the entire teacher librarian profession across uh, across Canada uh, and also outside of Canada as well. A lot of practitioner research doesn't just reach across our nation, but it also reaches across borders as well. And so this can really help deepen understanding for all of us. If we don't do it, who is going to? So that is really one of the reasons we need to be doing research. And so the first question that we normally have as we embark on this is, is this really research? Does this actually count? And yes, if it's conducted properly, using appropriate methodology, it follows ethical guidelines, we understand what its scope is, which is what, what we're trying to find out, what we're trying to do with it, and we share it. And that's one of the biggest things, and we'll talk about that a lot more at the end. But if we are doing all of those things, then we are doing research. So um, I just want to take a moment before we get into this piece on the impact on us and the profession uh, to do a quick in memoriam for Ross J. Todd, who passed away um, last week. Um, he was a professor of library science at Rutgers University and one of the foremost uh, library uh, researchers and school library researchers in the world. Um, and so uh, a lot of his studies uh, in recent years were on that practitioner piece of research and action research and everything like that. And so um, this is really, um, it really connects in with what we're doing. And unfortunately, uh, it's unfortunate to lose him. But uh, what is the impact on us and the profession? Well, evidence-based practice helps make the case of why you are at that school. Every year, budgets happen. Principals have to look at the budget and determine how much of the budget gets spent on different things. And it is unfortunate that we, but we know that a lot of the time that ends up being uh, looking at the ratio and just staffing to ratio. But it doesn't have to be. You can always go more. And part of that is going to come down to can the principal see why you would want to do that? Why that school should have an increase in TL time? And evidence-based practice where you can prove what it is you're doing and the effect you're having on your students' learning is a very good reason for them to be putting more money behind a TL. If you're not producing results, they're probably not going to look at uh, increasing TL time. But if you can show why you matter in the school context, that helps build the case enormously. And it doesn't just help you, it helps the whole profession as well. The more we engage in evidence-based uh, practice across the profession, the more we justify why we need to continue to exist. People are always questioning these days, why does a library exist? I can find everything online. I don't need a library. And we know as practitioners why. We can see it in all the misinformation that's out there, all the really poor uh, information literacy that's going on. And we can justify why to ourselves, but can we justify to someone who doesn't necessarily know what it is that we do and why it makes a difference? Well, that is what evidence-based practice does. It allows us to make that case. And so to quote Dr. Ross Todd, uh, for school librarians, the big question regarding evidence-based practice is, 
Why do school libraries matter today, particularly in the context of an educational world that increasingly relies on diverse, complex, and often conflicting sources of information? The answer lies in the student outcomes, specifically what school librarians can do in their instructional practice to ensure those outcomes. Evidence-based practice recognizes multiple sources, types of evidence, and ways of gathering evidence evidence. The use of multiple sources facilitates triangulation, an approach to data analysis that synthesizes data from multiple sources. By using and comparing data from new, a number of sources, you can develop stronger claims about your practices, impacts, and outcomes. And that really is the central thesis statement of everything we're going to be talking about. This is why. Because we can it's one thing to anecdotally claim, oh, I'm improving the student literacy rate. It's another to actually have the data in front of you and be able to say, no, this is exactly what we're doing and this is how it's impacting and this is why we need to continue it. Or this is what we're doing and this is not working and we need to look at this avenue or this avenue and we can't do it without having the evidence behind us. So. What are some research approaches that we can take? Well, there are the sort of scientific -y ones. These are the ones that you really think of when you're hearing the word research. So those correlational studies done by universities and other groups that look at that large scale data, look at the efficacy of something across multiple schools, across multiple uh, school districts across multiple provinces, even multiple countries, and look at how causation, uh, look at what the cause of different trends in that data might be. So that's the first one. And that's quite difficult for us as practitioners to do, not impossible, but it is a bit more difficult. Empirical studies, these are ones where the very strong observation and measuring um, it's building knowledge from experience rather than from theory or uh, uh, theorizing. Um, it's taking a hypothesis and testing it thoroughly until you know what you've got. And it can vary in scope and scale. And empirical uh, studies uh, can be very useful but they require a lot of management of how you're doing it to make sure that um, you're getting everything right. What we are looking for more than anything else is action research. Action research is practitioner-led. It's about addressing your questions and examining your practices and saying, I do this, does this work? If I do this, what will happen next? It helps you develop practical solutions to your questions. Those burning questions that you have about how you run your library, how you run your library programming, and how you can improve on yourself. And it is about moving you forward and moving your knowledge forward. And it is about, as I said, you as the practitioner, not an external expert, not someone who's coming in from outside and sweeping in and here's how we're going to do it and doing a study and then walking away and the data from it, like the results are matter in the moment for that study, but aren't necessarily going to be followed up for a, on a daily basis. Whereas action research is really about changing your practice going forward until you revisit that question and change it again. So how do we do it? Well, there's several stages to research that it really doesn't matter what the size of it is. And I'm going to give these in the broad scale, then we're gonna focus on action research. So here it is on the broad scale, identify the problem. What is your research question? What is it you want to find out? Do your literature review. Look at what other people have done. Has this question already been answered? If it has, fantastic. You can look to other people's research. 
Or you can question their research and go, well, they've said this, but I don't feel that's true. How am I going to ch uh, figure out my own method of this? Establish your methodology, how you're going to go about doing this. Collect your data, evaluate your data, and then organize everything, present and apply your findings. What if we're talking about action research though? Well, it's the same. Like it doesn't matter if we're doing research on a grand scale or on, a, on the action research scale. It is the same process, but we're going to use slightly different language because we're really mimicking through action research the same sort of ideas that we generally get students to think about when they're doing their own inquiry. Because action research is to uh, uh, our learning as inquiry-based learning is to a student's learning. It's that chance to ask questions, try to find out the answers, gain new knowledge, dig deeper, start again. And so here are the stages in the form of action research. We're going to ponder the problem and pose the inquiry question. What is it we are looking at? And what do we care about finding out? What is it we actually want to do with this information that we're going to uh, look at? What is it we want to know or change? For instance, it could be grade, uh, grade eight reading patterns. What is it that grade eight like to read? And how does that impact their, what we have in our book room? And so that might be your starting question. Peruse the data, the research and plan the action. Is there good in, uh, research out there? Can you find quantitative data that says, oh, uh, grade eights like reading this? Or do you need to look at your own ILS, your integrated library system, look at your own uh, school students and figure things out. Pers uh, pursue the plan and collect the data. This is about coming up with how you're going to do it and actually getting that data in there and figuring out where you're going to get it from, how often you're going to get it, and all of that kind of piece. Probe, analyze, and interpret the data. This is really that piece of getting all the um, little pieces together so that you can understand what it is you're looking at, your big uh, picture. And then pause, reflect, and share your findings. Have some method to get that information out. In action research, we often do want to take that moment and pause because it's about to impact our our practice. And so before we make the change, we want to really examine what we actually have found out and make sure that we're making the correct change from it. Um, as with uh, anything, the older age, uh, measure twice, cut once, really applies here. We are dealing with students when you're dealing with action research. If you make changes and uh, are too quick to make changes and um, jump from one thing to the other, that can be very confusing to students. You don't want to make changes that are going to impact their learning without really considering it. And so you need to know what it is that you're going to do and how you want to do it. So research methods. And I'm going to introduce a word here. Um, it's the word grok. I'm not sure if any of you have ever read Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert A. Heinlein, but if you haven't, grok is a word that he created for it. And it just means to intuitively understand something. So to be able to look at it and go, oh, I get that. And that feeling that, yes, I instantly can see it and understand it. And I can look at two similar things and understand them just because they have their similarities. That feeling, that's what he meant by grok. And so it's a computery term now uh, to be able to grok something. And I've used it here because it really does capture the essence of what we're talking about. So research methods, there's really three major research methods. There's quantitative, there's qualitative, and then there's the combined method. 
in quantitative uh, research, you're looking at numerical data. It's very statistical based. Um, it's quite easy to gather that information. You, you often have a lot of sources you can draw from. Um, that information is readily available in some form or might be might be a case of setting up some way to count something. Um, and you can easily see it and go, oh, I understand this data. It's normally quite easy to understand what the data is trying to, or what the data is showing you, not necessarily what it's saying. Uh, that's slightly different and we'll talk about that. It's very much the raw picture of here's the data without sort of all the interpretation to it. Qualitative data is all about the behaviors. It's all about the interactions. It's all about the ways in which people interact or things interact together. It is very difficult to intuitively understand. Um, it is hard to see just by looking at it sometimes how everything fits together. It's uh, what we would call inductive reasoning, that uh, um, way that you have to look at patterns and other pieces that allows you to make sense of it. Um, if you've ever had to do one of those Mensa IQ things where present you with loads of different patterns, you got to figure out oh what they're trying, what the missing one is, and that those are the kind of things that um, are more akin to qualitative. It's very much a a puzzle that you have to piece together, um, and so. It is in essentially the big picture that you're looking at here. It is that broad scope and it can be difficult to get that data. So quantitative data, easy to get, but doesn't give the full picture. Qualitative data, hard to get, time consuming, but gives you a much better idea of what's going on, especially the why of what's going on. It also gives a voice to those participating in it because it's done through interviews, it's done through focus groups, uh, it allows a voice to those people who are involved in it. But as you might be able to see, they're both not complete. A combined method can bring these two together and is often a very good way of doing it. It's not perfect, but it does allow you to examine both data and behavior at the same time and gives, allows you to let your stories give life to the data and the data to give authority back to the story. And so that can really pull everything together to use that combined method. It is a much, um, doing both can be very, very time consuming though to get all of the pieces in line. We're gonna talk for a moment before we go on about uh, indigenous epistemology. And a lot of this stuff uh, is from uh, Dr. Linda Tuay Smith. Um, if you're not um, uh, familiar with her work on decolonizing methodologies, and uh, I really strongly suggest uh, you look it up. Uh, same for Joanne Archibald's um, uh, Indigenous story work as well. That informs a lot of this. And so the first and most important piece is nothing about us without us. That is the idea that if the you are specifically making the subject of your research, uh, Indigenous students, Indigenous communities in some way, you must get the Indigenous community on uh, as part of it. It cannot be done to them. Um, it has to be done with. And that is a very, very important part because um, historically so much research was done to and was done in an abusive way. Um, 
And while we talk about residential schools a lot, we talk about all of these other things, we often don't talk about what happened in the medical fields. We often don't talk about what has happened in the university fields because universities and the medical profession also engaged in very disruptive practices um, uh, to indigenous people over the years, using research as a weapon and using research as a tool to further agendas. So it is really important that this first part is respected and that if you are planning on doing any kind of research with um, that is specifically about Indigenous students, that that is uh, front and center of what you're doing, that you go to the rights holders, you go to those people that uh, the community themselves and make sure that they are part of it, they are on board and that there's no surprises coming out that they have say on all of the collection and all of that. And we'll talk a bit more about that in consent as well. Uh, the other pieces are that it is very much rooted in the indigenous ways of knowing. So all of us in BC are probably very familiar with the First People with Principles um, uh, posters that come through Finesque. Um, I will attach those um, in the chat uh, in a bit. Uh, if you're not from BC, I don't know how uh, far across Canada they've proliferated. If uh, people in Ontario are aware when I talk about the first people's principles of uh, uh, first people's principles of learning and ways of knowing, if those posters are uh, available outside of BC. But um, it is a very place-based um, epistemology. And place base doesn't mean necessarily in a particular um, physical place, but also a temporal place. Um, that piece of journey of where you've come from and where you're going to is a very core piece of the Indigenous epistemology um, as outlined by uh, um, Joanne Archibald and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, to a Smith. Um, and so yeah. knowing how, um, how you've got there and what the context of where you are is. So it's more than just um, that physical piece, but like what is the history of everything that's happened to bring us to this point in all of the research? Um, and so that piece, that lens is a very important piece. Um, the second piece is the humility of the researcher, um, that research is must be undertaken in a humble manner, and it also humbles you. That by engaging in research, you're not, you're saying, I don't know, I want to find out. And it's not that engaging in this practice makes you better than someone else but also as you learn and as you absorb the knowledge that's coming in that you're listening to everything that the knowledge and the learning that you're doing is trying to tell you and finally protocol um, and by this i mean the ways in which we do things is a big part of research for in a indigenous context. That means mm -hmm. the ways in which um, we engage in all manner of things. For instance, in uh, if you're going out foraging uh, in uh, from an indigenous world viewpoint, you make sure that you're giving your offering. You're going to uh, make sure that you're acknowledging the land that is giving. Uh, it's uh, fruits and uh, berries to you and everything else that you're going to do. You don't take more than what you, uh, what you need. And all of those pieces are wrapped up into that worldview and that um, act. Whereas often coming from a Western point of view, going out foraging just means go and find stuff. It doesn't have as much of a structure to it or pieces that happen beforehand. 
And so with Indigenous epistemology, that is very much something that you need to be aware of, that there is a protocol and making sure everyone uh, who needs to be aware is aware and so on and so forth. If you are not um, Indigenous, and I'm not myself, um, making sure that uh, if you are in, trying to engage with Indigenous epistemology, that you are doing it in a respectful way as someone who is coming from outside um, is another really important piece. So we're going to move on now to ethics. And thank you, Nicole, for putting the finesse poster into the uh, chat. If uh, you aren't from BC, or even if you are from BC and you haven't seen it before, it's there for you. So research ethics. This is, research ethics is about making sure that what you're doing is going to not hurt other people in some manner. And it's about being respectful. Uh, we all live under codes of ethics already within our profession. We know ethics inside and out from that um, lens, or at least I hope we do. Um, we have our BCTF code of ethics in BC. We have our teacher regulation board ethics um, and so on and so forth. And um, research ethics has a lot of uh, overlap as well, but it is very specific. So the first thing is fairness and equity. Um, you can't, ex you shouldn't be excluding anyone from participating in the research unless the research has a specific thing you're looking for that is relevant to the purpose of research. So I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, you can't unduly overburden any one person or one group with, within the research, which means no doing something stupid like the Stanford Prison Experiment, uh, never a good idea. Um, and so when I said no exclusion, what that means is unless race, gender, et cetera, are actually a factor that you are specifically measuring, then it should not be a inclusion exclusion factor. So if you are looking at indigenous grad rates, then absolutely that is one where you would be able to say, we're only looking at this, you are either going based on self-identification or based on what's in my NBC or so on and so forth. What you wouldn't be able to do is go, I'm researching grad rates and I'm only looking at these things. Uh, if your question doesn't have something to do with it, it the inclusion exclusion is it is everyone. The second piece is consent. You must get consent. I don't know what happened. Has it gone giant for everyone else? Okay, I'm just going to stop screen sharing and reshare. I don't know why it went giant there. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. We're back at normal size, right? Excellent. Uh, consent. So consent, you have to gain consent of all of uh, the people involved before you start. You can't collect half your data and then go, oh, I need consent. You have to start with it. Uh, consent always has to be voluntary. The same as when you're using a web tool in BC, if you want to use a web tool with a class, you have to gain consent of either the parent, guardian, or the child themselves, depending on the age. You have to make sure it's voluntary and you have some other method that you can do if um, they're not, and they can withdraw it at any time. Same thing here. They can withdraw consent. If that happens, then you take their data and you delete it. Um, that is really important as part of the ethics that we are upholding that. 
The next piece is privacy. Everyone involved in it has a right to the privacy of their personal data. You don't go around talking about the people in your study just as you don't go about talking about the kids in your class. You have an accountability to the research um, data that you've collected that it is, will remain private in the same way that you have that same accountability to all of the students' personal data that you have in your possession through my EdBC, through all of the other things, through the anecdotal conversation with auntie who came and picked up little Johnny yesterday because mum was in the hospital or whatever. Like that stuff happens, but you have to keep it all uh, um, private and secure. Can't just go posting it onto your Facebook page. You should be putting it uh, on your desk and leaving it there on a piece of paper. Everything should remain locked up. Uh, data should also be anonymous unless specific consent is given and only if it is completely relevant to identify the person. Uh, there are levels of anonymity saying, uh, Joseph said this and it's a kid in the class and you don't identify what class or what school, that's pretty anonymous. Identifying the class or the school and then saying the student's name wouldn't be considered anonymous, so you would need to get consent. Um, the, you can use things like student A, student B, et cetera, to an, uh, anonymize your data. But overall, you have to have some kind of anonymity unless you are specifically requesting it and there's a good reason for you to do it. And when I say specifically request, I do mean when you ask for that consent, that you it is in there it's not just they consented to have their data taken they consented to have their data taken and this piece shared specifically um that there is minimal risk this includes risks to equity risks to consent risks to privacy that you have to minimize these risks at all time so here's a example are you interviewing uh LGBTQ students um, who may not be out um, and you've decided to do this in the busy library at your school, that is probably not going to be minimal risk. If you're doing it right then and that's the subject matter, you are risking them being outed. So that is an example of where you have to be careful. And finally, academic honesty. Please be honest in all of the things you're doing. You use your integrity. Don't make up your results. Don't fudge your data to make it look better. Like we've all seen the harm that can come from that kind of thing. Like there's pretty big examples out there of what happens when data is manipulated and is used in bad ways. So be honest about how you're doing it and don't plagiarize, obviously. So that's the ethics piece. Data analysis, and I know this is quite a dry topic and I've been speaking for a while. Uh, I'll give you a chance to get up and move around in a second, um, but we're gonna get through the main topic first. So uh, data analysis basics. What exactly do I mean by data? I've used the word a whole bunch of times during all of this. But what does it actually mean? Well, data is just information you have systemically, uh, systematically acquired uh, that you are purposely examining to make decisions. And it isn't just about quantitative numerical stuff. Data is anything that you have uh, got in a way, uh, a standardized way or a way that makes sense and uh, you're using to help you in, to help inform your decisions. So we're going to go through what it looks like to analyze your data as quantitative and as qualitative. So first off, quantitative. This is about taking that raw data and making it into usable information. Data in and of itself is nothing. 
data doesn't mean anything without analysis. Um, back when I was in high school, my teacher wrote on the board a one and put a space and then a zero. And he asked us what we were looking at. Was it binary? Does it mean 10, the number 10? What, what is it? Well, he was giving us an example of just data. It doesn't have any context there to tell us, is that binary? Is it 10? Is it uh, some other form of numerics? Like, is it internary or something like that? It could be anything. Um, we don't know unless we're analyzing it and we give it context. And so when we're analyzing quantitative data, that's really what we're doing. We're getting, um, con uh, giving context to that raw data. So we need to know what we're looking for before we begin. We need to record it in a manner that makes sense. And we need to do that for all of our data. And then we can begin to organize it. When we organize it, that means getting it into a form that you can easily compare specific parts with each other. So I'll give you an example of what one uh, quantitative data piece I do. So I am my district's uh, district teacher librarian, and um, every month I get the stats from every single school sent to me. I have a big spreadsheet and I put them in to each, uh, I have a tab for each school in the district and I put the circulation stats for each school into um, its tab. And then I can look at and compare my each school with themselves and I record the data over time. So it's um, by month and by year. And I can look at by the whole district what's going on. So I can see different pieces and I can compare that data because I've organized it in a way that makes sense. And I can share it out at board meetings when I need to. I can share it out with my staff and I can go to specific teacher librarians and say, I'm noticing this trend in your data. And I can only do that because I've taken the data, this raw information points and put it into a, into a manner that actually helps me make sense of it and allows me to make those comparisons easily. So that's an example of quantitative data and how we can analyze it. We have to get it, get the data in some way and then organize it. Qualitative data, on the other hand, while there is some similarities, is a little more complex. With it, there's the same two steps. We're going to get that data, but this time, instead of getting it from source like stats or your integrated library service or number of people that have uh, come through the door or number of classes taught or anything like that, you're getting it from interviews, from observations, from focus groups, from all sorts of different areas. And then you have to do coding. And coding doesn't mean like computer programming. Coding here is more akin to color coding. It's giving a structure to the information, just like we did before. But this time, instead of it being about uh, number structure, it's about patterns, themes, and trends. What are you seeing? How do you look, or what are you looking for in each one? Is it a a, um, um, a series of interviews being done after with a random group of students after a lesson where you're looking for specific words from that lesson. That can be a qualitative piece that you're looking to see how often they're talking about these, how often they're using um, these um, uh, words that you used. Um, how what are people looking to change? Uh, especially if you're looking to implement new library programs, that can be a big one. What is What are people looking for? And so you can categorize them. You can uh, go, oh, well, this person said they want more graphic novels, but this one said they want more manga, but that really 
there's a lot of overlap there. So we'll put that in the same bucket. And it's about creating those buckets that make sense to you. In quantitative, the buckets are very numerical based. In qualitative, those buckets are much more pattern, theme, words uh, based, looking for similarities. But both ways, it is about being able to compare it. So when you're coding the data in qualitative, you're going through it, you're adding something to it to mark it up in some way. It could be a symbol and you've got a legend of different symbols that you're going to use to mark your different patterns. Um, it could be color coding, it could be highlighting, lots of different ways you can do it. It just, you're marking it up in some way. So either way, there's two things we need to look at, validity and reliability. Validity is, does your data actually uh, measure what you think it does? Have you actually collected valid data? If you were looking for grade eight stuff and you've got so many grade eight, nine courses and you didn't actually listen to which kid is in grade eight and grade nine, have you actually collected the data you think you have? That can be a really uh, tricky point to work out if you're not paying attention. Reliability on the other hand is how consistent is your data collection? How are you making sure that your data collection is stable and consistent? And there is two things you need to account for. What is called your external problems, which are inaccuracies that come from how you're measuring. Um, if you're sitting there uh, counting the number of students that come in in a particular period in, in high school, uh, your inaccuracy could come from that moment you were distracted because you looked the other way to tell off a student and you missed five kids come in. It could be um, something else that's bringing in an external inaccuracy. And then there's also bias, which is your internal inaccuracies, where you are either discounting things or, or counting things wrong because you're including things based on preconceptions of what you're seeing in the data and how you are making mistakes because we all have different lenses that we're viewing the world through. And so those are the two things you really need to account for when you're talking about reliability. And again, everything I'm talking about is contained in much greater detail on the actual toolkit. This is just the overview. Whichever way we did, quantitative or qualitative, once we've made sure that we've got all of our own information, it's um, reliable, it's valid. The data analysis part that comes last is the visualization. It is the communication of the story of your information to external recipients, to those people that aren't involved in the study. And external doesn't mean having to be like outside of your school. External just means people who didn't help collect the data. Um, and you have to be careful when you're doing this part, not to oversimplify things, not to accidentally paint too broad of a picture or interpret the data so that you're missing nuance. Because a lot of data analysis comes down to what you're interpreting from it. And one of the biggest ones is the classic Correlation does not equal causation. Just because it, it matches up and it's a nice looking graph that you've come up with and the two graphs look the same, doesn't mean that they're actually connected. You have to be able to look at the pieces to understand why they're connected. And so be careful not to oversimplify. Where Once you've done your data analysis, now comes the sharing. This is, in my opinion, the most fun part, because it's very wide open how you share. The first thing you need to ask yourself is, who is your audience? Who is it that you're trying to talk to? Um, what is it that they need to know? So there are different needs. If you're presenting your data to students, if you're presenting your data to colleagues, if you're presenting to your principal, if you're presenting to the school board, if you're presenting to Treasure Mountain Canada, they are all very different audiences. 
and all have different needs. Do they need to hear things in a very succinct way? Have you got a very small time slot? Do they are they going to be okay with creativity in it? Um, but it is about communicating that story, and whichever way, focus on what you need to them to know and any background information they need to know as part of it. So how do you tell your story? Well, you can tell it in a lot of different ways. You can use graphs, you can use infographics. A picture paints a thousand words, they say. Uh, you can do interpretive dance, and I have seen people use interpretive dance to explain studies before. Uh, it does require someone who is actually good at it, but it actually works if someone knows how to do it properly. Uh, you can do it in skits or songs, poems, narratives, um, your journey, um, a video, a speech, whatever floats your boat, basically. Um, it really just has to be a way that effectively gets across to your audience what it is that you did, what the evidence was, and how you are using that data to progress yourself or progress your practice. That is really the essential parts of sharing. So at this point, take a moment, get up, stretch if you need to. Uh, and we're moving into the second sort of half of this, um, uh, not lecture, but uh, webinar. So the second piece we're going to talk about is Treasure Mountain Canada. So if you're not aware of what Treasure Mountain is, Treasure Mountain is a national research symposium. It moves around from province to province. Uh, every second year, it is in Ontario as part of the Ontario uh, Super Library Conference. Um, and on the off years, it is traveling province to province, partnering up with that province's Teacher Librarian Association. And so in uh, 2022, Treasure Mountain Canada will be in British Columbia. And this is what Treasure Mountain is about. It is about addressing learning for the future, supporting the reinvention of school libraries to address the evolving info and tech needs of learning for the future. It's inviting researchers, school library practitioners, educational leaders, and policymakers to collaborate and move forward together. It is collaboratively exploring ideas, inspiring each other, and building collective knowledge of the Learning Commons approach as sustainable school improvement. It is analyzing the Canadian research available and encouraging further academic and site-based research. That's where the action research we've talked about comes in. And it's alerting the school community and the educational community of the urgent need to refocus learning for the future and ignite the potential of school library learning commons. Uh, Treasure Mountain itself uh, started in the United States and Treasure Mountain Canada is a um, offshoot of it with permission um, that looks to do the same thing for Can Canadian research that Treasure Mountain was looking to do in the United States. And so this Treasure Mountain is going to be in New West Secondary School in New Westminster, BC on Friday, October the 21st and Saturday, October 22nd. Uh, I did not proofread that apparently. Uh, it is not temporarily uh, on the same day somehow. Uh, they are two different days, uh, Friday, October 21st and Saturday, October 22nd. We begin with a dinner and evening keynote uh, on Friday, which will happen after the BC Teacher Librarian Association Conference that will begin in the morning. It will be a very long day if you're going to both, um, but if you're going to both, don't worry, we've got some fantastic things planned. We have two amazing keynotes for the BC TLA coming. So, we really hope that you'll attend both. Uh, and then we have our dinner and evening keynote. And then on Saturday, we have our actual symposium for uh, TMC. And so the symposium is where the research papers are going to be presented. And so what 
today is really about is sparking you to think about what it is that you want to do as a library practitioner, as a person in a school library learning commons, as a person who interacts with school library learning commons, and think about what you might want to explore and report back in a paper to Treasure Mountain Canada. Um, so the full details on exactly when all the papers will need to be submitted is on the link. Um, and I will be sending this slideshow along with the recording out to everyone uh, who registered. Um, so, but you can go and look right now if you uh, look on your favorite search engine for TMC, um, uh, Canadian School Libraries, you'll find uh, the call for papers is out already and has the details of exactly when all the dates are. I keep getting it wrong, so I'm not going to try and say the date because I think I've said it wrong three times now and I'll probably do it again. Um, as I said, it is partnered with the BC Teacher Librarian Association's full conference. We are still looking for workshop proposals and uh, you have until mid-May to um, uh, send in your proposals for workshops and then uh, long I think it's the long weekend of May I close uh, workshop proposals and then uh, beginning end of May beginning of June is when we'll open up registration for both TMC7 and the BCTLA conference. Our keynotes for the BCTLA are in the morning David A. Robertson will be in person presenting um, and then in the afternoon live streamed for both the in-person people and we're doing a hybrid conference so there'll be online people uh, uh, live streamed for both from Ontario will be Ivan Coyote. Um, Ivan unfortunately won't be able to make it in person uh, because uh, they are teaching in Ontario um, and have a class uh, the day before so um, it was just easier if we did a live stream so that's what we'll be doing. Uh, so that opens up to both. Uh, so if you register, there'll be a package for just TMC and a one that uh, covers both. Um, and you'll get a chance to see both of those amazing speakers uh, and uh, listen to some other presentations by library practitioners during the day, because uh, there'll be two workshop slots. Um, and then in the evening, you'll be at TMC7. Um, we have uh, booked rooms off on a hotel, but I don't think we're ready to announce what the hotel is just yet. Uh, so I'm not gonna do that today, but I believe uh, that has been sorted now, what hotel we're using. And uh, I think the hotel we're using, I think is going to be the same one for the dinner, but I'm not 100% sure. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to have a few people who are joining us who have presented at Treasure Mountain Canada before. I have Monica Berra from School District 57 in BC, uh, Leona Prince from School District 91, is that right? 91? Yeah, uh, in BC, uh, Nacheco Lakes, um, Diana Malsaweski, uh, uh, hopefully I said your name right. Um, no, I have not said it anywhere close. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, from Ontario and Jennifer Mac Brown from Ontario and Pippa Davies uh, from uh, one of our BC uh, private school districts. Uh, and they're all going to be talking about what they have done um, for TMC in the past and uh, what their practitioner research looked like. So we're going to start off with Monica. Um, so I'm going to spotlight you. I hopefully can do both at the same time. Does okay. spotlighting you, has that got rid of the um, um, screen share? Do you see Monica? No, you don't see Monica either? Okay. I, I uh, see you, well, I'm fine. I also, I only see, I see Monica and the screen share. I see both. Oh, you do see both. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, that's what you're supposed to see is Monica and the screen share at the same time. So Monica, take her away. You're to talk about uh, your TMC journey. Yeah, I think my T's, 
This is a very personal journey and I'm so pleased to see Carol on today. And for some of you will know this journey, um, Pippa and Leona, because you were a big part of it. And so if you could just uh, go to the next slide, Joseph. So when I first started in 2012, I went down to Victoria and I met Carol previously and David was there. And we had been really, my, my paper's about is really about, um, we had been playing with the idea of maker education and where our learning commons would go. And I was um, awarded this incredible opportunity of moving a district resource center to a district learning commons. And it was the first time in our province that they put an administrator, it was a brand new position, I was a brand new administrator straight to here, to move from a library to a learning commons. And so with all the reading, we knew we were playing with this idea of maker education. And Pippa was uh, playing with it at that same time. And I couldn't quite come up with where that, how I could not just sell it, but really support it in honoring learning. And um, I am sitting at a table, I'm totally overwhelmed to be with these incredible teacher librarians. And uh, David Lurcher puts this up and he holds up a poster that actually even has a spelling error on it. I just bubbled because all of a sudden a year of thinking, a year of thinking was already, was totally synthesized in this poster. Next slide. So the Youth Tech Maker poster, the whole model became our district's um, framework for moving forward. And I think for anyone in BC knows we have applied design skills and technology that doesn't come in because this is actually happening in 2012, 2013. So when I wrote my paper, um, I, we'd already done the research. We already knew the why. I was already into human-centered design. And so we had done our literature review and our questions, but we didn't have the how. So we went into a collaborative teacher inquiry at a district level. And if you read the paper, you'll see, I look back and I think, well, this is such commonplace, but at the time it wasn't. And I, I kept to the four pillars of the learning commons at that time, inquiry, collaborations, reflective practice, and um, learning by doing. And every day I would actually do reflective practice. How am I hitting the four? But this paper actually led to a predictions. Um, when I first presented it in Ohio, it was really exciting, but we didn't have our BC curriculum. By the time um, we actually present this at TCM4, our new curriculum's coming in, and there is our applied design skills and technology curriculum that absolutely mirrored and built off of the UTech maker model. I was so excited about this. You could go into principal's um, buildings, and you would actually see that poster up. Um, in the paper, and that's what you don't need to be afraid of. So we did, it really does share the journey, our hunches, um, our inquiry, and how I was able to bring on our first starters. And that was starting with principals. And I remember even um, presenting to the principals in our district. And it was just really sharing those hunches. And so I just put down some of the things that we that uh, Prince George actually started to do, and we continue to do. And I really think that if you take a look at it, you will see that um, we did follow the CSL research toolkit, but that actually didn't exist at the time. But what did exist was David and Carol. And I cannot tell you how many times I reached out via email and they would answer me back because I was sitting here in Prince George, it'd be snowing, it'd be dark outside, and that truly was um, a difference maker. So I'm glad to see everybody on here. And uh, you are gonna hear from Leona and from Jennifer, and I've had the privilege of uh, working with them on big projects. 
So the, the paper is there, but I will say that I think when you're looking at action research, as Carol said to me, the responsibility lies on us to keep this going. And I've always held that very closely in my heart. Thank you. So um, thank you, Monica, for sharing your TMC uh, journey. And it really wasn't a very um, uh, academic paper that you wrote. It was very much grounded in, this is what we're trying to do. And at the time, as you said, like we didn't know ADST was coming down the pipeline or anything like that. We just, it was, we're noticing this, we want to, do right by the learning commons model. The learning commons model says learning by doing. This is learning by doing. How do we do it? And that was really the essential parts of what was going on, the questions that were being asked. And it it may have been a TMC paper, but it also ran into BCTLA summer conference, uh, IT for IT 4K12 here in BC as well. Uh, we presented at so many different things in so many different ways, and it with so many different groups that were spinning out of that. We uh, had people present at Finesque and other yeah. places that all span out of this research that you originally did um, for TMC. So, um, Leona, would you like to share next? Uh, you are muted. Oh, there we go. I don't know, my, my buttons are... Is that good? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'll put the paper in the chat. And so if you want to go way back five years, you can go and do that <laughs> and just have a reread. And um, like Monica said, the paper is uh, why taking your seat at the fire. Um, and it really is a journey um, about culturally relevant and, and responsive education at the time. Um, we started this as members of the professional learning team. Monica invited me on formal, you know, formerly Iraq, now focused education. And we started talking about how we take our libraries and make sure that there's culturally responsive and authentic resources that are out there. This is the beginnings of those conversations. Um, people were really unsure about what should be in your, your resource catalogs. Um, and I feel like you know, even though that was, we started that road trip in 2015, this paper was 2017, uh, you know, five years ago, that we're still there. There's still that tentative piece. Um, what this year has taught me with everything, the truths we've had to reconcile in the last year, um, we before we didn't even have that language, um, you know, TRC and all those things. If it had been there, it would have been embedded in this paper. So it was really interesting to refocus on that. So I go to this crazy treasure mountain I've never heard of before. Monica got all excited and was like, you know, come with us. This is great. Let's write a paper. I'm like, okay, um, because we're doing really interesting things in terms of how we looked at our collections and um, and how we reshaped it so we could support teachers in this work um, and also support our teacher librarians in doing this work and feeling confident to do this work. And so um, taking your seat at, at the fire is an inv invitation to sit together and to also see who's around your fire, who are the people that are around you. Um, it, it's been an interesting journey for sure. Um, it was interesting. I just read this paper and I'm like, oh my goodness, I said all those things. And uh, so it's good that there's accountability and Treasure Mountain keeps you honest. And, and uh, I think the, the, the shift, those things are still present, right? We're still looking at resources and critically examining our own practices five years later. We still have that hesitancy. Um, and I'll tell you a little story because I think that it's still relevant today. You see the shift in language, you see some of the things that we said, but now we've replaced it with decolonization and, and all of the harder words, the deeper work, but the work is still the same. And so uh, I think like in terms of 
how our teacher librarians, whom I still work with, I still try to promote and give them the confidence to do this work, you know, alongside our communities. I, I feel like we're all chomping at the bit to do this work still, to be culturally responsive, to be respectful. All of the things that Joseph talked about in this not research paper, uh, <laughs> after he went through that whole research, this is not a research paper. This is informational, but really um, sets the stage for teacher librarians and hopefully supports them in this work. So in this past year, uh, I've been reflecting on you know, where we've come from, it's weird to see something from five years ago and be like, what has happened since then? A lot. There's a great renaissance of Indigenous literature. Um, you know, there's, there's a ton of publications. So you're at a time when there's so much good stories coming out. I remember back five years ago, we we're kind of cringing at some of the stuff in the stacks. And, uh, and, uh, and now we have this bounty uh, and, and a new surge of new authors coming and these stories that are just coming out. Um, you know, last night I couldn't sleep. It was like 1 a.m. I woke up and there's this story that just keeps knocking on my brain. And, uh, and it's really interesting. I even have a title, which is the hardest part, but I was looking at this piece and I was like, what is this story? What, why does it keep bothering me? So I got up in the middle of the night and now I know to have like uh, a notebook beside my my bed and I just writing out these sentences and it really is the bookends of this book the front this the 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 beginning and the end and um it's for all the children from mixed backgrounds so you can see that I don't know if it comes from creator I often think that my stories come from creator because there's just this surge of energy and then the book writes itself and I I kind of you know do this blackout thing and I come to and I was like oh I just wrote a book you know and it's just like <laughs> these pieces but I think it's and I think the stories are so important but I still see this hesitancy and I want you guys to know because um, yeah, thank you, Monica, for filling in the gaps. There's so much going on. I'm so excited at the work that you as a group are all doing. Um, but I, I, I want you to be confident if I'm going to tell you anything from, you know, because these are the same people that are at Monica, that were invited to Monica, and we were invited to your fire. And here we are five years later, sitting around the same circle, having the conversation, extending our knowledge. And so um, what I've learned um, I mentioned to, you know, the panel before we started that I'm learning my language and what I know and what I've learned, because I'm also reflecting as an educator as I'm in this cohort of Indigenous people from the nations around here. And the one thing I want public education to know and the message that I got as I've been sitting in that through the first course is our people are just as scared to take that step. Everyone often thinks that we're ready and we're chopping up, but you know, chem loops and everything that's been discovered in this last year shows you just where we really are. It, it positions us in a place. And um, what's interesting for me to see is the truth telling piece and what's going on. And uh, in, in this country is that our people are just at the start line and also afraid to take that step. So there's this, there's this misconception that Indigenous people, I mean, I just talk a lot, so there's this misconception that a lot of Indigenous people are where I'm at in my journey. Um, but what I want to impress upon you is that people want to do the work too. Um, indigenous people want to work alongside, but there's, there's a hesitancy that the healthy one on both sides. I think, you know, we're going to all have to jump over together um, and that's going to be the best work. And so again, that resurgence of the idea of who's around your fire and that we need to support each other in this work um, because that's the only way that it can happen. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's been an incredible amount of learning. Um, it's interesting because I didn't realize some of my privileges. You can see the language, the language growth since that paper. I, I think it's a gift that Treasure Mountain has those papers and you know sort of puts a timeline of your thinking and then you can see that growth in the thinking of the system but also very personally um and it, it would be interesting to do a follow-up paper um yeah. and and talk about 
you know, where my community is. I've been sitting in these classes with these language students and I realize now I was talking about privilege and the privilege of always going, gone to public school and public school as savior. And so even with, when, I, when I'm speaking to you, you, you and I speak in similar terms, but I'm realizing very quickly that the experience of my people is very current the experience of my people, um, I had, I didn't even have a, a grasp of, and that's what this whole year has taught me. And so I think the beauty of uncovering everything and, and then um, understanding the truths that we're exploring in, in current day, it, it affects your work, it affects everybody's work. But I think the beauty of it is that you have to go through the hard stuff in order to get to the good stuff. And so um, what feels like a really confusing time and I get teacher librarian questions you know, all the time, like, can I use this? I don't know if I can do this, I don't. And I'm, I'm, I'm holding their hands, but uh, uh, I, I'm trying to as well prepare our communities because you know we work with 14 First Nations here um, to, to also have courage to join the fire. I think there was an assumption that, you know, when we first were all hopped up on TRC, that there was a natural, you know, that we we're gonna all just take our spaces, but it's often we're preaching to the choir and you are my choir. Um, I'm learning really quickly through the revelations in my own family. Um, my partner went to a day school. My mother went to a day school. Grandmother went to residential school. This year has been a year of revelations for me and I didn't realize the depths of everything. And so I don't even have that perspective because my experience has been positive. I always position, you know, public schools as savior. That's why I'm such a, you know, a, a cheerleader for public education because it really, that's the place that it held, education held in my mind but I see where our people are at. I see um, them not even be able to, to, not even to be able to say the sounds that I take for granted, that I have the privilege of knowing. Because in my public school way back when in K to four, I was taught by my great auntie to speak my language. And so um, there's people who are my age who went through different schooling systems who can't speak that language today. And so there's a healthy hesitancy. And what I want you to take away from this, it's not only you, it's the country and where we are at. And that's the impact on your work. And I think collectively, if we just sit down and have courageous conversations with each other and, and really reconcile this journey, um, you know, uh, Tyrone, from Finesque, he once said, we have to move quickly, slowly. And so I feel like th this group, you have such a voracious appetite to move things forward. Um, and we do, there's, there's an expediency to this work, but we have to do it with caution because not everyone is where we are at. And that's one of the biggest lessons. So I think I love the echoes of that paper and, and seeing where we are today and how that, because from five years to now, the transition, like I haven't written anything about resources and, and, and yet I'm dealing with them all the time. Like what has that transition been and, and where are we now? And how do we begin to move things forward? Because we thought we were beginning back then. We we're just getting excited about it. <laughs> that's, that's it, oh, it's a Masai. Thank you so much, you guys, many steadlies. Thank you very much, Leona. And I would like to respectfully disagree with you uh, that what you did is not research. Uh, I, it absolutely is. And the key things that you said that tell me that it's research was it was shining a light on the way forward. And that is what action research is about. It is helping set that stage to move us forward. And I put in the chat two things that came from your paper. The first was the uh, culturally relevant and responsive uh, school library learning commons um, that was so fundamental. Uh, and then uh, just this last summer, uh, we spun that out into a toolkit, um, very similar to the research toolkit called the Collection Div Diversity Toolkit uh, that was worked on by a group of us from across Canada. Um, so myself and Rebecca Rubio from BC, uh, Janelle St. Auburn, uh, Rabia Kokar, um, uh, 
I'm forgetting the other two. Uh, there were two others and their names are escaping me. I feel really bad. I should just look at the bottom. It says it at the bottom of this page. Um, uh, Tony Duvall and Judith Sykes, uh, along with um, Anita and Carol from Canadian School Libraries, put together a research, uh, a collection diversity toolkit that was very much built on that foundation from your paper. So do not sell yourself short. Um, next, continuing BC, we'll have Pippa um, and then uh, Jennifer and Diana. Um, just being aware of time, uh, I'm going to uh, try to give you a five minute war, uh, five minutes. OK, Pippa, off you go. I'm going to replace. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yeah, OK, perfect. Um, so hi to everyone. Uh, I'm just so thrilled that I can be part of this meeting here today. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I didn't add my articles to um, the chat, but the articles that I have written in the past have all stemmed from Carol Cochlin and David Locher, who I met many years ago, um, along with some of uh, you lovely ladies, um, Monica, and then gentlemen as well, Joseph and Leona, um, just inspirations as I was starting my journey with Heritage Christian Online School. I've been there for the past 17 years, and during that time, I've created two different websites and changed circulation systems three times, tried different approaches to the physical design of the Learning Commons. And it has been very easy for me to, because I've been there for so long, to observe and assess statistics and draw conclusions with regards to literacy and academics. Um, along the way, I have used ebook stats, technology integration, uh, engaging literacy and STEAM promotional activities, so STEAM being uh, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Um, I've used statistics from my WordPress websites. I've used subscriptions and analytics. Uh, I've used FSA statistics and our cross-curricular unit study kits so that I can make conclusions, draw conclusions on how our students are faring academically in all literacies. Um, and so I met uh, Monica at a conference, um, I think after I had met Carol Cochlin and um, David Lurcher, and I was super excited along with Monica about doing Maker Aid, yeah. but also the theory of building a learning commons. I remember reading the book and thinking, man, this has got so much amazing content. And if I can just visualize this into my virtual commons, then I'd be able to build that physical commons uh, perfectly. We had a very small physical commons based in Kelowna, and we just didn't have enough space. And so part of my learning process was try and devise a, a virtual commons that would incorporate many of the fundamental principles outlined in that book. Um, and because we're distance learning based, we wanted to create a virtual commons that was engaging, that would support teacher and parent work mutually um, together to support student learning. So we work with a lot of different educational pedagogies uh, to try and find the right fit for our students. And we have learned along the way experientially through trial and error, what has worked and what hasn't worked. Um, and where innovation has occurred, uh, we've tried to monitor that progress and analyze student response. So in the beginning, when I uh, initiated the building and learning comments, I drew in my uh, research uh, to motivate for the this new approach with my admin team and they were super excited about it so um, this helped me motivate moving forward uh, the whole philosophy behind why the learning commons was important as opposed to a library so um, people got excited about both the digital as well as the physical commons um, and now we're in the stage of planning for a brand new hybrid physical learning commons to be built. And I'm so excited because this next stage of my research will definitely um, be geared towards hybridized learning commons. And I don't know how many there are uh, in the lower mainland or elsewhere. I think there are a few in the States. Um, 
So I'm excited to see how the physical commons will now take shape based on the virtual commons. So we did some basic renovations in the beginning, um, you know, alongside the virtual commons, but now we're going to see it more on a broader scale. So I'm really excited about designing a new learning common space that is generated from not only theory, but past experience and a new hybrid approach. So unique in the educational me methodology, which lends itself to the learning commons as shared in building a learning commons. So for my next project, I'm going to pose the question, how does the effective use of space and technology drive learning in the learning commons? So I'll include research into library design, gain new knowledge into mobile furniture, hybrid educational pedagogy and innovations in libraries using both quantitative and qualitative data. I might take some field trips to discover some learning commons in BC that Carol has already highlighted for me so that I can um, check out these spaces. And then I will uh, evaluate all my collected data and present it in a report, which may include stories, demographics, statistics and surveys. And I may include some secondary research as well to discover how other schools have created hybrid learning commons environments. And so I may include graphs and other images in my presentations. So that's it from me. I hope I didn't go over five minutes. <laughs> oh, thanks for the, all the chat. Just Thank you very much, Pepper. Uh, we're going to jump on now to Diana. Hey, thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, so my name is Diana Moloshevsky. My, my pronouns are she and her. Uh, and I'm a teacher librarian in the Toronto District School Board in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I am going to be short and sweet I, because I've written five papers for Treasure Mountain, Canada. I, I wrote my first one in 2010. Um, and yes, I've written five and I'm planning to do two more for Treasure Mountain Canada 7. So we don't have time to talk about all seven of my papers. So instead, <laughs> I'm just going to talk about three things that I think might be helpful for you when you're writing your Treasure Mountain Canada paper, okay? Number one, pick something that you're interested in exploring. Don't just write a paper because you think it would be a good topic. Pick something that you are truly passionate about. Number two, find somebody to chat about it with uh, as you're doing your process. Each one of my papers, I found somebody to chew their ear off and it's great to have that research buddy. If you need me to be your buddy, my Twitter handle is Ms. Molly TL and I'll put it in the chat. Number three, uh, don't sweat the research, don't sweat the final project. It sounds really scary, it's not really scary. And so, I look forward to hopefully seeing some of you either virtually or in person at BCTLA and Treasure Mountain Canada 7. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to put up next uh, Jen. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Brown. I've put uh, the link to the two papers I've written for Treasure Mountain in the past in the link in the chat, my apologies, the link is there. Um, I put them there not because I expect you to take the time to read it as you get through your work week, because I want to show you that the word paper isn't scary. And as Carol can attest to, um, when she very lovingly came to me, you know, virtually in 2017 and said, you need to do this because you're already telling everybody what you're doing. So let's turn it into a paper. Um, I, I kind of went, what do you mean write a paper? I'm just trying to run a library. Um, I'm a teacher librarian in Ontario in the Peel District School Board, um, just adjacent to Diana. And uh, I am in a K to 12, K to 8 um, uh, elementary library, which I built from scratch, which is a whole other conversation. If you've had that opportunity, you know it's a gift and a journey. Um, and uh, like Diana, I'm not going to focus on the content, but I want to show you that I tend to push the envelope about how I share my information. Um, and in terms of really listening to the opening and thinking about the research toolkit, I just want you all, if you've never done it before, to really know you're already doing this. You're already doing it. You are already researching your practice each time that you respond to the students you serve. Each time you notice and name something that's working or not working and you shift your practice, you're doing action research. 
you're already doing it. It's not on top of. Um, for me, this practice became about documenting the evidence I was already gathering to guide the decisions I was making as a teacher librarian. We don't make decisions just because they come out of nowhere. We collaborate, co-construct, and connect with the students we serve and the educators that are also serving them. And then we make decisions. So how am I documenting that? If you're an early years person like me, you're really into pedagogical documentation. So I took everything I learned from those kindergarten educators in our spaces, which is probably everything I know is from those kindergarten educators. And I thought, how can I document this? After Carol kind of pushed me, like maybe give this a go. Um, how you organize your final reflection and research, very open-ended um, as was shared. And here's the thing, sharing with the school library community, the national, for some folks, international, um, local, whatever community you define for yourself, it benefits your own practice. As Diana said, you have those constructive, thoughtful conversations. Um, and Leona said the courageous conversations, you find those folks who are critical friends. You want those critical friends, not the people who just tell you're amazing all the time. Um, and you will probably be supporting someone else who you may never even meet just by your paper existing. And I liked that it was highlighted that the papers get archived. So you can go back and see your own journey, but other folks can use this. When they're advocating with that principal or district lead, they can take your paper and say, hey, Someone else wrote about this and there's documentation that says this is working or this isn't working and we can advocate for that. So I like Diana, I'm here if you wanna talk. Uh, I'm a talker, this is short for me. I think Diana and I did better than we normally do when we present together because we usually talk a really long time. Um, but um, the journey is so exciting. Document the things you're already doing and synthesize it in a way that reflects who you are and who the students are that you serve. And the last thing I'll say, uh, the second paper that I submitted, I had written a written version of the paper, um, digital, and I was working with a group of students, actually from our student-led uh, Gender Sexuality Alliance, and they were producing their own podcast. And we were learning about what that looked like. And I said this to the panel before we started, I'm a big believer and I don't ask anything of my students that I won't ask of myself. And they said, Miss, um, what are you doing with podcasting? I'm like, well, I'm supporting you. And, you know, I, I listen to lots. And then I shifted my entire Treasure Mountain final product into a website that is a gathering of podcast style clips of me talking about my practice and talking about my redefining of collaboration over, at that point, the five years that I had been at the school that I've now been at for seven years. And so you have that power and flexibility to document the amazing stuff you're already doing for other school library practitioners and the people who hold the money to hear the impact you're having on students. So please leave feeling inspired and know that you're, you're the inspiration because you're already doing this work. It's just how would you like to document it and share it coming this October? And I can't wait to hear and see what everybody comes up with. Thank you very much. Um, and I just want to say, Snachalio Mbe Holdelian, which is um, I'm very thankful for all of your uh, teaching that you've just done and the learning that I've received. Uh, I think I've said that right. That should be from one person to two or more people. I am trying to learn uh, Deketh, our local language. Um, uh, uh, specifically the uh, Clately dialect, but I'm not a very good <laughs> language learner. I failed French, German, Spanish, and Japanese, so I, I'm doing my best. Uh, thank you very much for sticking with us. I know we ran five minutes over time, but that's okay. Um, what I, I'm going to keep this open uh, for a little while afterwards in case people have questions. Uh, I'll stick around for at least until five. Um, if you have questions and want to ask them, feel free at that point. Um, but I would like you to just see each of the people that we had, Leona, Diana, Pippa, Jennifer, Monica, and the journeys that they went on through this, and the fact that all of their journeys were rooted in what they wanted to accomplish in their space. It was never about, oh, what might be good in somewhere else like it was always starting from 
what do I actually want out of this? And that's where you need to start. And Diana gave us some really good tips for that. So check out some of the past papers. Thank you very much. Uh, Masi Chua to all of you. I'm going to turn off the recording now. Thank you.